how I handle. Oh, good. Let's record it now. Okay. How I handle things at work is like I like to um, go out for a train ride or a sub, you know, like a streetcar ride somewhere to see things that are pretty. That's what I tend to do when I'm having a hard time is go look for something beautiful to focus on, even if it's raining. So I'm going to uh, pass it off to the next individual. Um, how about Gloria? I'm going to call on you, introduction, and then how do you handle a stressful work environment? What, what do you typically do is my question. Hello, Amy. It's good to see everybody. What I do is I like to walk a marine drive. It's something about the water that is so soothing to me. So I like to walk a marine drive if it's raining or if the sun is shining. I can't hear you, Amy. Okay, typically what we do in these meetings is like when we're doing introductions, we have the individual like call on someone else. So if oh, you can- Oh, okay. Jared. Call it popcorn, I guess. Okay. Uh, hey there, uh, Jared Hager, he, him pronouns. I'm with the US Department of Justice here in my role as monitor of the settlement agreement between the United States and the city of Portland. Uh, and I think uh, my go-to when I'm stressed at work is a nice walk around a uh, couple of city blocks and a stop to drink some coffee outdoors. That usually gets me uh, yes. curiously relaxed. A little bit of caffeine does it. Um, appreciate the question. Thanks, Amy. And I will uh, pass it to um, uh, Britt. Hi everyone, I am Britt Urban. Um, I'm with Portland Street Response. I'm a mental health crisis clinician with the team. Um, and thank you for having us, by the way. Um, but I, I would say I also take a lot of walks um, during the day when, I, when I'm feeling stressed. Mm Brett, call on someone. Sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'll pass it to Chase. Thanks, Brett. Uh, my name is Chase Bryson. I'm the Crisis Intervention Team Coordinator um, for the Portland Police Bureau up in the Behavioral Health Unit. Uh, as far as stressed at work, uh, if I can, like listening to some music is always nice. Um, or I echo Jared in that uh, getting out and grabbing a cup of coffee is always helpful. And I will go to Tremaine. But then that means I figured out the mute, but not the video. So thanks, Chase. This is Tremaine Clayton, uh, he, they pronouns. I'm the paramedic firefighter for Portland Street Response. And um, I'm also a music person. Um, I like to get into the uh, vehicle and then I'll just kind of put on some music and sing loud with my earplugs in so um, others might be able to enjoy um, what I think is great music. But uh, yeah, that's what I do. Um, and I'll pass it to Robin. Thanks, Trey. Um, my name is Robin Burick, and I am the program manager for Portland Street Response, gender pronouns she, her, hers. Um, you know, I hate to be so redundant, but I have actually, what I've been doing lately is turning off the news and um, just listening to classical music. So I listen to that on the way to work and the way back, and that has been a game changer for me. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Katrina Wilson. Talk. Hello, sorry, I didn't realize we all got to speak. Um, <laughs> but um, I also enjoy, well, lately I've started running and that has helped um, to calm a lot of things, um, along with, um, like Robin said, turning off the news and not paying attention to that. <laughs> so 
Um, who else? Let's see. How about Theo? Did Theo go? No. No, I didn't. I'm happy to go. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Theo Lada. I'm a Peace Up staff member. I appreciate y'all being here. I use uh, he, him pronouns. Um, and it depends on the time of day. If my son is home from school, uh, then I get very close in his face and I tell him that he's beautiful and it makes him uncomfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. And that makes me happy uh, because he like looks at me kind of like this. That makes me happy. I also like to walk um, and yeah, I like to go for walks and all throughout Portland. Like, I feel like you get to know Portland really wonderfully and you get to know the different sights and smells and how they feel different parts of the city. Yeah, so it's really cool. Um, I will pass it to Anika. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Anika Bent Albert. I'm deputy city attorney, city attorney's office and current um, liaison attorney for PSEP. Um, I would say in those stressful times, I do a lot of what everyone has mentioned in terms of getting a quick exercise workout or listening, dancing to music. But I think a phone call to like my grandmother or my mother also works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'll pass this to Sarah, who's our, one of our new uh, attorneys in our office. Hi, I'm Sarah Ames, and this is my third day working as a deputy city attorney. I have been um, asked to help be the council liaison on the DOJ settlement. And so as such, Anik invited me to join this group and see what you're all about and meet some new people. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I, um, and you know, truth be told, I tend to you know stress eat. So when I'm being good, I make myself some herbal tea and listen to some Buena Vista Social Club or something else like that while I'm working. It helps. And um, let's see, I've got Byron Christopher Vaughn here with a football thing behind him. So it has, have you gone yet? All right. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, that's Marshawn Lynch behind me. Uh, I'm a big Cal Bear fan, so sorry, Duck fans. I, uh, I don't have any pronouns. I'm on the PSEP committee. I'm a PSEP committee member. I am on the behavioral subcommittee. Um, what was the question, Theo? I didn't hear the question. Or what was the question? It was a question, question from Amy. And uh, to paraphrase, the wonderful question is, what do you do to de-stress uh, or as a, as, as a coping mechanism for stress when you're uh, during your regular day. I picked up a new thing, um, listening to rain and thunder on YouTube really loud and just rain and thunder and rain just falling down on tin sheds or whatever. So uh, and I and back and so listening to music. Uh, who do I pass it to? Yeah. Hi. Sorry I'm late. I was stuck in traffic. Um, just got here. I'm Tia. My pronouns are she, her. I'm on the Behavioral Health PSEP subcommittee. And what was the question? Um, it was, what do you do to, to cope with stress? Oh. I just got done with acupuncture. The question was, how do you cope with stress in the workplace? Oh, in the workplace. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't do acupuncture at work. Um, lots of deep breathing and good and communication. Thank you. So who do we have left? Bob Davis? There we go. Um, there we go again. I'm Bob Davis. I'm a retired internal medicine physician. I'm retired, so I don't have any stress in the workplace. I'm on the boards of uh, Bobby Lakes Hope Center and the uh, Portland Public Safety Action Coalition. I was on the work group for uh, Portland Street Response, and I'm on the advisory committee for uh, Behavioral Health Emergency Coordination Network. And uh, I'll take any kind of music over over news any day to relax. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Claire. Who's left? Uh, we have Mary Claire, we have Claudia, and we have Rochelle. And we have Barb. She hasn't Barb. gone yet. Okay, Barb oh, is Barb. good. Thank you. You go. I was busy trying to write down who we had left. Hello, everyone. My name is Barb Renish. I am Amy's right hand because she's left-handed. And I use she, her pronouns. Cute. And I, now that I work from home or I'm at home, I'll scream into a pillow if stuff gets that bad. But when I used to work up in the lab, Definitely getting out of the building and breathing fresh air and walking wherever I could walk. And usually just sitting there and like watching nature for a little bit too, as part of that. And I'm going to call on Mary Claire. Aw, oh, thanks, Barb. Uh, I'm Mary Claire Buckley. Oops, let's see if the camera's off there. There you go. Uh, and I am the Inspector General at the Portland Police Bureau, and here is in my role as uh, DOJ Compliance for the Bureau. Um, she, her pronouns, and uh, I hate to, you know, tell all of you people, but you're really barking up the wrong tree. The thing you reach for is chocolate because it cures everything. So <laughs> that's what I reach for when uh, I'm stressed, as you can well tell. Um, and then a walk, but chocolate's the first grab. Thanks. And I will uh, pass it to, who'd you say was left? Sorry. Oh, Rochelle. I think I heard your name. Hi, uh, my name is Rochelle Silver. I'm a, a retired psychologist. Uh, I don't work, so I don't have any stress. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you all for your wonderful ideas. Now we're going to, um, okay, Claudia, sorry. If I don't keep going, I'm going to, yeah, forget. So go ahead, Claudia. I'm so sorry. Hi. Welcome everyone. My name is Claudia. I'm a project assistant for Pisa. I um, mean, usually I just like turn on jazz music. Um, when we were in office, I did a lot of jazz while working. So um, I kind of kept that going, working from home. Thank you all for being here. Okay, is everybody gone that wants to contribute? Perfect. Okay, now we're gonna, um, Theo kindly posted our group values in the chat, but um, Claudia, you wanna do a quick like screenshot so folks can read it if they can't, because yeah, chat is hard to follow when you're talking for some of us. So these are the group values that um, PSEP as a whole came up with. And so um, I'm just, we're just gonna put it on the screen real fast, hopefully. No? It's okay. They're in the chat. Oh, you guys, it didn't show up? That's weird. Okay, let me try one more time. Okay. Can you guys see it now? Here we are. Thank you. No problem. Would you uh, like to read them real quick? Would you mind? Yeah, no problem. All right, so these are the piece of group values. And the first one is listen effectively and respectfully, share airtime, be present and open to new information and perspectives, assume positive intent, respect each other, respect the group, speak your own truth, communicate directly, effectively, and respectfully, ask questions to clarify, call out bias, and be okay with ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And then I'll also just share the really quick um, Zoom keeping since we got bombed <laughs> earlier. Yes, thank you. So these are the Zoom meetings and I'll uh, let folks read those. But um, I think the most important one is the Zoom bombing. So once we do see that, we do um, try to remove folks and report it. Uh, today was a little different because there was multiple Zoom bombs at once. Um, but so that's why the meeting had to end it. But thank you guys all for coming back and joining us.
Thank you, Claudia. <clears throat> There's a couple of them I want changed. All right, well, now that we've um, got some wonderful presentations for tonight, um, <clears throat> I need to ask everybody a big favor though first, because this is like, I don't know where else to go. My particular team of folks, we uh, lost our nurse. She moved back to Chicago to take care of her mom. And my whole team is freaking out because we need a nurse who can dispense medications, give injections, and willing to work with people who are high intensity folks. And we're just not getting applicants. And our team is, our clients are suffering terribly because we don't have anyone to fill in the gaps. So if any of you know um, a nurse who might be interested in working in the um, forensic program, forensic act program with us at Cascadia, uh, send me an email at, um, yeah, at my email address because we really need to start interviewing more people. So thank you for my list for listening, but nurses are so important in our program and so hard to come by. So Bob Davis, if you know of anyone, I'd really appreciate your help in sequestering someone because this is a terrible time to be without someone. So thank you all. So now we're gonna move into our agenda and um, the agenda is posted in the chat for all of you who don't wanna do it on the website. It's in the body of the Zoom meeting. And so we're going to introduce our folks from the Portland Street Response pilot program. And we're going to hear all about what's happening. So, Robin, are you the lead on this conversation? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, so, thank you for having us here today. Um, you may be aware there was just a recent six month evaluation done by Portland State University. And I have a presentation that I can give, but I also know um, we have two, two members from our team here today, Britt Urban and Tremaine Clayton, and um, was asked that they maybe provide some information and details about kind of what they're seeing on the ground and share some of their experiences. And so I'd kind of like to start there and we'll see where the conversation goes. And um, if we have time, I'm happy to share some updates. I'm guessing you guys are probably familiar. You've been following along with the PSR six month evaluation. So I really wanted to give time to them tonight to share with you. Um, so Britt and Trey, um, I'll let you guys go ahead and take it from here. Go ahead, Tremaine. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Britt. Um, hello, I'm uh, Tremaine Clayton. I'm the Portland uh, Fire and Rescue Firefighter Paramedic. Uh, that is part of PSR-1. Um, PSR-1 is myself and Britt as the two responders. And then we have Heather Middleton and Heiko Mushi, our community health workers. And uh, those are two folks that we can call when uh, engaging with individuals out in the field um, to try to assist with getting some um, connections to resources other than 911 um, and or emergency departments um, for their needs. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, let's see. Oh, are there questions? Let me double check the chat because if uh, there's questions, I could just keep on going with those as well. Oh, no, it looks like that's just a PSR. Yes, PSR is Portland Street Response. And um, yeah, Britt, do you want to talk about some of the calls we respond on? Hold on, before you guys get going, I think it would be really helpful for a lot of us if you could maybe give us some background of why you got started and how, you know, how you're all functioning together under the department. Sure, I'll take that one um, first is, uh, yeah, so 16, one of our firefighters, uh, nurse, is also a nurse, Lisa Reslock. She was um, piloting a program with Tri-County 911, which is um, a program out of the Multnomah County EMS office that was looking at call data for AMR, the uh, paramedic transport company here in Portland, and emergency department use. So the county takes care of that AMR aspect um, and, and the transporting to hospitals. So they were looking at individuals who are utilizing 911 um, for services at a high volume rate, but 
not really finding um, true medical emergencies. So they, they called that low acuity. And uh, Portland Fire, because we're a co-responder, we're a city medical response, um, in addition to firefighting services. I'm a paramedic, and uh, most all of our rigs have paramedics and or EMT, uh, EMTs on that uh, vehicle. So we'll co-respond with AMR. And so that was picking up some of the data, but the fire department was going on fire only calls, most often lift assists um, or other mild medical needs um, that we would later determine to be high volume, low acuity. And so that was the pilot program that Lisa was doing looking at that data. I took that program um, and kept it going in 2017. And I was trying to apply the same chat program in terms of the um, follow-up after those calls, but noticing that it was very effective if you had a house. If you are a houseless individual, there was really no way to track you. So I was trying to figure out a way in real time how I could meet that houseless individual to try to connect them to resources so they wouldn't utilize 911. And that led me to Street Roots um, when I was looking for a client and discussing that short, brief uh, summary of what I just explained. Um, I shared that with Street Roots and they were already kind of doing a bigger look at how the houseless community was being engaged by 911 services um, at the hospital, uh, by the fire department, EMS, and also police. And um, there was a 2018 report that came out talking about 50% of houseless individuals um, being arrested when encountered by police. And so we just started brainstorming and said, what would it look like um, if we were to bring that to Portland? And I just gave a little bit of my experience uh, as a volunteer with Whitebird, which is the parent company of Cahoots. And Emily kind of did the rest in terms of outlining um, what that new street response could look like um, with all the information and all those pieces there. And so, um, yeah, we with changes that were coming on, we had a new commissioner who believed in that system and that program. We had a new fire chief also that was very community focused. And so it just seemed like the stars aligned. And um, the concept of street response kind of came came to be. That was amazing. Thank you. And now it all makes sense to me. This is, you know, this is a good launch point. Like if typically what we do is we allow everybody to, to talk and then we do a Q&A afterwards, you know, so everyone has a chance to hear all the information and then respond. So we'll let your partner go next. And then what we'll do is we'll build upon that. So maybe folks can think about what other questions they might have. That was beautiful. Thank you, Tremaine. So um, who would like to go? Who's going next? Britt. Yeah, I can, I can take, take it from here. Excellent. Um, so I can, I can talk a little bit about the types of calls that we're going on um, and what we're what we're generally seeing a lot in the streets. Um, the main calls that we're going on are um, kind of lower acuity welfare checks for people in outdoor spaces or public spaces. Um, so it could be someone who's outdoors in distress, like outside of a business or outside of a home um, who is not is observably not doing well. Um, and another one we go on often is someone who's down and unchecked, so potentially unconscious. Um, often turns out they're sleeping, but someone you know calls in that, that they're not sure if this person's doing okay. Um, we also go on um, one that on the fire side, those two, those two types of calls are ones that uh, police traditionally would have gone on. Um, and, that, and so we've started taking those lower acuity uh, welfare checks. And then on the fire side, we do go to illegal burn calls. Um, because those are often associated with uh, houseless camps. And so we would go on those and do any kind of follow-up if, if a tent burned down or if someone's in need of resources or follow-up, we would follow up on those. Am I forgetting any major um, calls? You also we... intersect with suspicious person calls. Oh, right. Passing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Unwanted yeah. Person. Unwanted persons or trespassing calls in businesses. Um, we would go on those and, off, and oftentimes we're called out to those to um, engage the person and, and we're not enforcement so we wouldn't, we wouldn't um, like force them to move along but the business owner or homeowner who is calling, calling in this um, 
this person who's unwanted at the at the location, um, we would normally engage them and then oftentimes get them to move along, but that's not usually our goal. Um, and so yeah, those are a lot of the, the main types of calls that were going on. And a lot of the folks that we are working with are um, houseless. Um, and um, there is, I would say like a majority of the calls that we go on are people who are experiencing a mental health crisis or a substance use related crisis. So that's kind of the types of calls we go on. Um, Tremaine, do you wanna talk a little bit about any specific calls like recently that have gone well? Yeah, um, actually, so one of the, the unique, like the unique thing about this team and this program that we're bringing compared when, when we're talking about an alternate response model really is BRIT um, in terms of the city resources. And um, there was this one call in particular where um, we had police, fire, AMR, all on scene, this uh, um, just kind of standing around like, what do we do? And <laughs> Britt walked up and said, hey, how's it going? Um, do you wanna just have a seat here? The, the person was on the gurney in the back of the ambulance on her way to the hospital where she needed care. And, and it was just like, you couldn't have had that go any better, but really it, it was just a different approach. It wasn't a bunch of uniforms with these protocols, like this is uh, what we have to do the next, the next, the next. And, and it's just been a real delight having that opportunity as a first responder to have protocols, but to have some freedom to really have the, the patient dictate what their needs are. And, and really that's, that's the, alternate response model that we're bringing is making it client-centered and having them help us kind of guide their care. And then once we help them understand the resources that are available other than those traditional things, that's where the planning becomes a little more effective in terms of the success for that individual client. I can say that that doesn't always happen. It doesn't always just turn out beautifully like that. But um, I can also talk a little bit about our, um, like our work um, when we have had to work with police or the BHU, um, kind of our, our experience so far has been overwhelmingly positive in the community. Like police are starting to recognize PSR as, a, as an option to call so that they can, um, so they can go on those higher acuity calls. So it, like within our, within our, um, geographic region that we do respond, we've started to get to know the officers in that area and they're starting to learn, like recognize that they can call us or like kind of pass calls off to us um, through dispatch or even be on scene and recognize it's a mental health related call um, that that they don't necessarily need to be at and then call us out to come come out instead or, or take over for them. So we have been doing that quite a bit. Um, and then also we started to, um, we started in the last three or four months have monthly meetings with the BHU officers and clinicians to kind of see where our work overlaps, um, how we can collaborate in the field and um, and also, you know, if there is overlap, like how can we support each other or like who is who is most appropriate to work with this individual, that kind of There's thing. There's a question you can answer. Sorry. Does someone have a question? Yeah, sorry, okay. someone threw in oh, chat, yeah. what is BHU? Oh, BHU? So maybe we're gonna have to remember. No, oh, I'll do that. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Behavioral like when you're behavior. speaking, if you can say the acronym and then say the name, maybe it just, you know, over time, we'll all get you maybe used to it. You know what I mean? I'm yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, just used to saying certain things. Um, so the Behavioral Health Unit at Portland Police Bureau, um, uh, which is a, both officers on that team and then mental health clinicians. Um, so we we do hold monthly meetings with them now, like I said, to see see how we can collaborate and and best support each other. Um, Tremaine, is there anything you want to add? Or Robin? No, the only thing I would um, add, just there was a question that's come up uh, before about um, transporting and where they go um you know oftentimes uh, like i said earlier amr is the county resource and with the exception of unity if unity is taking ambulances um ambulance is will traditionally just take someone to 
the emergency department and recognizing someone in mental health crises is not having a medical crisis. That's why the emergency department is not appropriate. Um, furthermore, when someone is drug affected, um, even if there is a mental health um, component underlying, initially the emergency, depart emergency department could be necessary if someone was having difficulty breathing as a result of that um, drug use. Uh, but once they are stable, then, you know, ongoing treatment isn't, isn't appropriate at the emergency department. So um, just recognizing when people are calling 911, if they're looking just to take someone to the hospital, just to get them out, out of the street, um, that's something that's not appropriate for those people in those cases. And, and uh, so sometimes people will see us engage an individual and then leave them on the streets. And really it is, it's just a matter of safety planning and recognizing if there is no medical emergency, um, being in the hospital is likely to incur bills that they may not be able to pay, um, exposing them to sicknesses or illnesses that they may be more susceptible to. So, so just kind of recognizing what it means to um, meet somebody where they're at and, and just trying to utilize the resources that we have, which oftentimes really is the power of that individual looking for that change. So maybe it is someone else that calls 911 on them, but um, once they realize who we are, because sometimes initially they won't want to engage with us, but when we start to see them time and time again, they start to develop a trust. And that's when we can start to recognize, yes, you've been going through this system forever. It's not serving your needs. What are your needs? And what resources are there really for you to uh, to better your situation? And again, it's that that client centered focus that helps them um, be more successful. So, a lot of questions again are like, how do you measure success when they see us in, engaging an individual um, and leaving them there? The connection was made, and we're hoping to build off of those encounters. So that's that was one. Hopefully, I clarified that. Wow, you have really just made my mind whirl with a ton of questions. Um, my first one is, do you have a set of protocols for determining who they're hooked up with already for health care, for mental health care? Do you ever assess and ask those questions? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't we don't have a specific protocol at this point, but when we if we are working with someone and um, they're open to um, follow, getting, getting follow-up with our community health workers who do the follow-up piece on the team, um, the community health workers would do that further assessment um, to see like, are they connected to services already, whether it's mental health or primary care, that kind of thing, and then help them reconnect to those services if they've, if they've lost that connection, that kind of thing. Thank you. This Brit, they you guys have you guys have um, referred people to the the walking clinic and to uh, Unity as well has been another area that you've had to refer to. So there's there are a few. There's a difference between being in crisis and needing to be referred to immediate services, and then the follow up work that um, our community health workers can do as that aftercare support. And so. Um, there's, there's the separation there, but there's both opportunities. I hope that's clear. That is perfect. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> because I'm trying to figure out, well, I have a story to share and I can't share any names, but it's a good story because we have individuals who are high needs and high intents to work with. And um, you guys showed up at a call for the individual and it was a very successful outcome. So when I heard that you had showed up and helped them out, I was really excited to know that the program is actually working. Um, and for me, I have 40 people I'm trying to keep tabs on and I wish there was a way to connect the dots through software. Um, have you guys ever heard of the program called Collective Medical? It's a software program that's supposed to connect the hospitals to us and other teams. And um, 
it tells it tells the hospitals who their caregivers are, what meds are on, a whole bunch of information. And I just was thinking, if y'all had access, you might be able to slow down the number of unnecessary ER visits, you know, that kind of thing. So you may want to look into it and see it's called something like it. You know, are you using Epic? No. No, this is this is Tremaine. Actually, um, the collective medical. Um, I, I learned this back in 2017. That's the we know it as the Eddie system. Um, so oh, okay. um, yeah, it's it's the Eddie system, which is emergency department, emergency department. information exchange. And okay. because as first responders, now this may change um, with different legislation that's uh, currently in the works. And now that oh. we um, are serving as mental health clinicians or have mental health clinicians on our, our team, um, they could change some of the legislation. But currently, as first responders, we are an access point to the healthcare system. We okay. are technically allied health professionals, but not actually healthcare. So that's a technicality, which is why in 2017, when we were trying to look at some of that, we weren't able to engage with that service. But things are changing rapidly. Um, in terms of legislation trying to change and make mental health more accessible and and a lot of different states are looking at the fire department to do that so we're it's it's coming along we're just baby steps right now um i did see tia had a question her hand was go up. ahead tia okay um i was wondering what you think about if 911 is um how they're doing and getting the right incidents to you. Um, do you feel like you're getting what you need from 911? And my second question is, can the person calling 911 ask for PSR to come out? I can take at least part of that question. Um, yes, you can call and ask for PSR through 911. Um, it, but then it, it all depends on like what area of town you're in um, right. because we are, we are currently limited to, well, we just, we just expanded to all of Portland Police Bureau's uh, East Precinct, um, okay. which is about triple the size of where we were just in Lent. So we just did that on Monday, switched over um, to the new area. Um, so it's a much bigger area that we're responding to now. Um, and you can request us, but then there are certain things that would, um, criteria that would, um, not allow us to be sent out, which would be if there are weapons present or observed, and um, if there's any kind of violence or crime happening. I think those are the main criteria that would that would not allow us to go out. And Robin, you can take it from there. Yeah. So your first question about whether there's any missed calls and are we getting sent um, by by BOIC, which is the Bureau of Emergency Communications, um, that. Um, so we have weekly meetings and check-ins with them and they frequently audit all of the calls that come in during our operational time to see if their dispatchers are missing any calls. I would say probably 98, 99% of the time they're not missing any calls. There is the occasional one or two that they do miss. Um, and I think, you know, this is a learning curve for them. It's a pilot for them just as much as it's a pilot for us. So they're still learning that. They do have a series of triage questions that's almost formulaic that they go through that helps them decide in how to triage, whether it's police, fire, AMR, or ourselves. Um, and so that's that's really helpful. I think what the struggle is that we're with like police and fire, you have these specific call types like trespassing. That's pretty clear what trespassing is, right? Um, person down welfare check. That's kind of a bigger, broader category, but it's descriptive. And with Portland Street Response, the challenge has been um, we don't actually have specific call types identified to dispatch to PSR. So basically, they're just looking for scenarios or they're looking for keywords like mental health, 
Substance use intoxication might be something that's brought up by the caller. Um, and these things might intersect with a whole host of different call types that police and fire have. Like illegal burn, who would ever think that Portland Street response would ever go on an illegal burn? Illegal burns are typically houseless fires. Um, they're typically warming or, or cooking fires, but we kind of inserted ourselves in there because we we're like, that's working with the houses population and we wanna be there to be able to assist them. We have community health workers who might be able, if they're, it's a cooking fire, we can get them connected and get some food to them. So um, it's a little challenging to to all of a sudden kind of create a new category of call types for Portland Street Response. It's not that clear cut. And so there's a huge learning curve here. Right now, our criteria is very narrow. So the criteria like Britt was talking about was um, it's got to be outside. And the scenarios that they've identified is somebody standing out on a bike lane or on a sidewalk and they're yelling. Um, that could be a Portland Street Response call. Somebody calls um, because there's a person down on the sidewalk and they're unchecked and um, they're, the person doesn't want to check on them themselves, so they call 911. And so that would be considered like a welfare check call or person down. So those are um, kind of how they're triaging them and we're learning as we're going so that we can kind of expand those scenarios. Uh, as we go along. So in our hope, and Britt had talked about this, we just expanded our, um, our geography. So now we're in all of East Precinct. Also this Thursday, starting this Thursday, November 4th, we're adding a second shift. So we'll have a new team working uh, Thursday through Sunday from uh, 6 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. Really fun hours to be working. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's going to be happening. Um, and then we're hopeful that the negotiations with PPA will be going in our way here soon and we'll be able to start going into residences and into shelters um, and potentially even take uh, suicide calls. So there's a whole host of ways that we're looking to expand our services in the meantime before the end of our pilot is up. Thanks. Uh, Byron, did you still have a question? Yeah, I had a, uh, was wondering how good are these, uh, need help keeping these people in these programs? Is that a challenge that you guys have to deal with in a sense where, like you, I think you touched on it a little bit, Tremaine, you know, you see these people over time, they start to build trust in you. So when you say something, they take it as, okay, yeah, this guy is really telling me something. Is that a problem? And how is interacting family members trying to get them back involved and does welfare checks, is that a, like a precursor to being home, houseless, homelessness in a sense? Well, on the, on the first part of it, um, in, in terms of like keeping people in programs, it was more in my role um, with the community health um, assessment team where I was um, connecting folks to resource such as um, treatments where I was literally taking them to like detox um, and or um, inpatient care. And um, it was typically the houselessness in my experience with the two individuals I was working with, it was, it was, um, not having anywhere to go after they completed any sort of treatment that just kind of put them right back into that spot and, and more likely to um, relapse. We don't really do that so much on the response aspect of it, but um, we do have, <laughs> sorry, I do have a, a loud house right now. Um, we do have, um, our community health workers are probably doing more of that long-term continuing care. And so I'm definitely seeing the relationships being built um, with the clients that we are connecting um, with our community health workers, because really that's where that ongoing care is being seen. And then as far as the precursor, um, that's, that's definitely a data point we're aware of when we're looking at social determinants of health. But um, right now, I think that's a pretty broad scope and I don't know how, how close we are to really focusing on some of those um, precursors because we are only focused with uh, folks that are outside right now in terms of our response and not necessarily going on those welfare checks indoors. So um, 
we have worked with uh, BHU in the sense of someone, you know, trying to help prevent um, an eviction. And so our community, again, that was our community health workers that were linked into that process. Okay, Gloria, you have a question. You're on mute. Gloria, you're on mute. Better turn your mic on, girl. Yeah. Uh oh. Hey, I'm learning to use the mute, the unmute, and the reaction. It's taken me a while, but I'm catching it on. I'm catching on to it. I needed to know if earlier in the Oregonian they talked about how 911 calls were so overwhelming that they couldn't handle all the calls. So they were redirecting the calls to 311. Is 311 you? Is, is that PSR? Such a great question, and thank you for asking that. Um, so 311 is the city's customer service number. So you want to report a pothole, you want to pay a utility bill, you can call 311 and get that. The discussion was whether to separate BOIC, who is our 911 call center, if we should separate the non-emergency line away from the 911 dispatchers. So when you call the non-emergency number, you're actually getting the same dispatchers and call intakers that answer 911. And they have to prioritize all these calls that come in. Um, and so of course they're gonna always give preference to the, the callers calling 911 and because those are emergency. So the commissioner Maps has come along and said, now that he's, he's the commissioner over BOEC, he's saying, we really need to sort of separate the non-emergency calls that are coming in so that they can actually get addressed faster and more efficient. Um, and there's already an existing 311 here with the city that the city is building that is more of the customer service. So let's see if we can take a portion of the non-emergency calls and push them over to 311. 311 is not the number that you would call right now to request PSR. You want to still call 911 or the non-emergency number. And actually, right now, we would recommend that you just call 911. Don't even bother with the non-emergency number because we have heard from countless individuals that they cannot connect to the non-emergency number. And we've missed a lot of calls um, that we could have responded to because of that. And BOIC is very well aware of those and that's what they're addressing right now for us. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Barb has a question. She does. I was not prepared for that. But that's okay. She always has lots of questions. So can you guys call cabs for people to get them to where they need to go, whether it be like back to a shelter if they've lost a shoe or something, or to the hospital if it's not an emergency? I mean, if it's not, you know what I mean? Urgent, but not emergent. I'm not sure where that is. Give me some examples. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we, we can and do. Um, I wouldn't say super frequently, but like we've tabbed someone to the Cascadia walk-in center before who was not doing well mentally, but not needing to go to the emergency department. Um, we don't typically like cab one cab someone back to like a home or like a, a residence but we have because that was kind of the only, like we called someone's like mom or somebody to get them to the right place so it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis if it makes sense and it will resolve the crisis then we we will do that trey and i were out in the field one time and we went on a call the call was a welfare check. Um, somebody was down on the ground and they wanted, the caller wanted us to check on this person. And they happened to be right by a bus stop. And they were laying down in the shade because they had a sun allergy. 
and um, the bus kept passing by them because they didn't realize that that person was waiting on the bus, right? They were in the grass by a bush in the shade. And so when we arrived um, and sort of assessed everything, we realized this person was pretty frustrated that the bus kept passing. And so we did, that's one example where we did get a taxi for that person so that they could get to where they needed to go. So that's an example. Tia, did you have a question? To me, to me, you just answered all of them. Yeah, I was in the chat. I uh, sorry, Barb. I sent all the responses to you the first time, not realizing that uh, I had just one person selected. So I, I hopefully updated the chat um, to answer those three questions, four questions, and um, yeah. I had a quick question for the. Um, PSR team, do you, after six months, you already had your final decision. Do you, is there anything else you see that we can help out or see anything where in the future that might become something or anything that you've seen so far that you forgot to say last week? Well, I, I just want to say, you know, we have the fall bump proposal in now, and it appears that we have full unanimous support for that, which is woo, awesome, right? And what that will do is that will actually allow us to add an additional four vans. So that'll give us a total of six vans uh, that we can add. By March of 2022, we can go citywide with six vans. That will be three vans in the daytime, three vans at night. Still doesn't get us to 24 seven. So um, what we need is in January of 2022, we'll begin to put together our full budget request um, for full citywide expansion at 24 seven hours at full scale. And we'll need to get more council approval at that point. So your support with the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget will be um, very helpful if you would endorse that and push that forward, that'd be great. Um, the other piece to this too, of course, is labor negotiations. I don't know how much pull you guys have with labor negotiations, but of mm -hmm. course, uh, that's our that's our um, next hurdle that we need to go over, right, in order to be able to continue to expand our criteria. It's been pretty made, pretty clear up to now, Jared's on this call, the DOJ is in full support of, of PSR and our citywide expansion. That's not a hurdle that we need to worry about overcoming at this point. And so um, really now it just comes down to the labor negotiations with police and fire, and then the, and then the elected officials ultimately um, agreeing to expand us to full citywide 24 seven operations starting probably next summer is when we're going to try to phase that in. So, and Britt and Trey, I don't know if there's anything else from being on the ground that you want to add to that, that the, you think would be relevant for them to know and support. I would say that, I mean, the biggest thing that we're seeing um, as a barrier to doing to making more of an impact is like some of the major gaps in services um, as far as mental health services um, beyond the emergency department and the walk-in center. Um, getting people like that kind of subacute care is really, that would be important. So any kind of advocacy or um, lobbying that you, I don't know what all, what your role is um, in that realm, but. Um, but yeah, gaps in services as far as mental health services and substance use treatment um, for people who need it that day. And also same with um, shelter beds and, um, and long-term housing. I mean, I think what we know what's happening in, in Portland right now is a, is a crisis. And so we're seeing that on the ground as far as being able to connect people in the moment um, or even in the short term is really difficult. Is gap service, you said a gap in service, is that you meeting somebody right now and taking them straight to that front door to give them service? Is that, can you elaborate on, on that a little bit? Yeah, so if we're, a lot of the people that we are meeting are, are houseless, are living on the streets. So um, we, you know, if we meet them and they're in the midst of a mental health crisis, we don't have a place that we can necessarily take them that's the right level of care for what they need. So we can take them to the emergency department, but that's not really the right place for them. Um, 
they need a place there's we need more options for people to be able to go to get the right mental health treatment um and same goes with substance use treatment there really isn't a lot there aren't there's not a sobering center right now um or like detox that's easy to get into quickly so yeah this is what i was talking about like the extra problems you guys might be having that can be tied up that can help you you know what i mean to be able to mm -hmm. do your job more effectively mm -hmm. and there's a question is there a way you can connect to ppb if they are needed at a call yeah we're on the radio so um the same dispatch system that police are um so we can request police um if they are needed on scene um, Brett, this is Amy here. I wanted to fill you in on something that happened last year. And that is prior to last year, pretty much everybody had independent ability to refer into a lot of these shelters, a lot of these programs, Hooper Detox and um, drug and alcohol. But Care Oregon decided nobody's going to do referrals to anywhere except them. So they're mandated every, every referral for these outpatient facilities or whatever, they have to be pre-approved <clears throat> by Care Oregon. So that's a major barrier, right? Is the fact that the insurance companies are the ones controlling the access. And then there's the limitation of providers. So my question for you now is, are you familiar that peer wellness specialists can actually do a lot more uh, negotiating, navigating, researching into, uh, you know, getting people mental health as well as community health workers. So, you know, I just want to throw that out there that I yeah. really kind of, I'm trying to build a workforce of forensic peer wellness specialists, which is what I am. And I'm like the only one in the state that works with the criminal justice system yeah. and folks that you're working with. So if we could expand the peer, you know, wellness uh, worker population in your expansion, you'll probably get a lot more folks who can do the kind of care coordination that you're all talking about that's disconnection because it's all just paperwork. If you fill out the right paperwork and you get the right referral, you can potentially get people into housing on the spot but not really, but typically it, that's how it's done. So I just want to put my two cents out there because I go through this every single day trying yeah. to figure out how to get my people into places they need now. And the other thing is not everybody wants mental health treatment. They don't want it. They like where they're at. They're happy where they're at. And there's nothing saying we have to force them to take medication even when they go to jail. They're not forced medicated. So there's a triple problem that we all have to be aware of. And that is everyone has a right to live the way they choose, whether it's on the streets or off the streets. And we have to learn to work with them in that respect. Thank you. Yeah, hey, hey. absolutely. And I would say to that, um, our, you know, our service is voluntary. And so whatever people, we, our clients kind of guide the, um, the interaction and kind of whatever they want to happen is what we, we um, respect, so of course we would never want um, want someone to go to mental health treatment or substance use treatment if that's not what they feel they need. Um, and also, just a positive thing that you you'll be happy about is we just we did just hire two peer support specialists um, for our team too. So we they have started um, just last week actually. And one of our community health workers just got her peer wellness certification as well. So. Nice. Awesome. I'm excited. I had a quick suggestion or maybe it sounds like the PSR needs like maybe um, like an apartment building or something to take your people to, to get them, then take them somewhere else, you know, like a staging area to help these people to move them forward. Um, is that something that maybe could be helped put into a budget or somewhere of that sense? We have, um, well, we haven't pursued that. So that's an interesting idea. And thank you for throwing that out. What we have pursued is seeing if we could reserve shelter beds or beds with different service facilities, crisis facilities. Um, we haven't been able to put a whole lot of time and effort into that, but that's definitely something that we're trying to pursue. I like your idea. That's pretty cool. 
Um, I would have to definitely discuss that with Commissioner Hardesty staff and see if that's the direction, but I like the out of the box, box thinking there for sure. Thank you. Kevin, will you explain the difference between your peer support specialists and your peer wellness specialists and your community health workers pretty please not because it's a test but because i'm like doing shit in the stuff in the chat sure um so it's interesting you know when we started this program we didn't really understand quite frankly the difference between these different certifications and it's been a really good learning curve for us um you know, our community health workers, they really get trained on outreach and representing a community that they serve. And then when we hired the two that we did, we sat down with them and kind of asked where, where within the scope of their job did they want to take it? One said that she wanted to really focus more on cases and doing case, case work with um, individuals. And her passion was really with housing. And so it's just 27 years of working um, with houseless, uh, houseless community members trying to get them housed. So we've kind of plugged her in there. And Heike, she really is focused a lot on community engagement and outreach. And she really specializes in, uh, she's an immigrant herself. So she really focuses on working with the immigrant population and BIPOC population as well. The peers, they typically are more focused, of course, with um, mental health and substance use. They have lived experience there. And so what we're really excited about now, we've literally had our peers on our team. Um, they, they joined three weeks ago and they're actually gonna start, um, start like launching this week. Um, one of the things that we have planned, well, is two different uses of them. One peer we've got embedded in our first responder team. So instead of just Trey and Britt going, it's going to be a firefighter EMT paired with our mental health crisis responder and then a peer support specialist. And this is a new role um, for, for the peer. I don't think it's a traditional role, but this was actually out of feedback that we'd gotten from a community um, survey that community members by and large wanted individuals with lived experience and peer support specialists specifically on, embedded within our team. So um, we'll have the three of them go out and they'll be going and taking calls together and de-escalating and meet, meeting people where they're at. Um, and the other peer that we have embedded uh, with our other two community health workers working in the daytime is gonna be um, available to sort of split his time, but also work very closely with Heather on the cases that she's doing and offer peer support um, with the individuals that she's working with. And then going out with uh, Heike, we've started doing some pop-up events and seeing if he can get connected with individuals. We're, we're specifically doing a lot of outreach right now to the houseless community. And, um, and I think Zeke will be really great there. So. Um, one of the cool things, too, that we've been talking about utilizing Kelly, who's our evening peer support that's embedded within the, um, the response team, is let's say somebody has to go to the hospital in the middle of the night, um, then she as a peer can actually offer to go with them. She can uh, be at the hospital and advocate for them and make sure that they have the support that they need, right? And that then allows the rest of the team to continue to respond to calls um, and allow Kelly to really work with someone who, who in the middle of the night might need that support. So that's kind of the difference um, where we're not embedding the community health workers in the initial response. Um, and they're, they're there more for the aftercare support and the outreach and engagement. And the peers are there really to walk with someone in the midst of their crisis and to um, be able to support them with the various institutions and organizations that that person might intersect with, whether that's mental health or the hospital system or um, basic doctor's visits, that sort of thing. I hope I answered that well. <laughs> Barb, did I miss anything that you would add to that? Okay, um, Barbara's good. That was a great explanation. Byron, you had another question, comment? 
Yeah, is it far-fetched to say that the services that you guys need to continue, is it too far-fetched to say that can they be open 24 seven? Because, you know, between eight o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning, there's a lot of activity going on. So sometimes you have to stop and wait and be like, well, we can't do nothing with you until something, some of these services open up. So can that help with you guys in the future? Um, so just so I understand, are you talking about like what kinds of services are you referring to? Are you, are you meaning like um, like uh, mental health appointments or um, detox, getting them into detox, those types of things? Well, um, whoever might come across you guys' paths after mm -hmm. hours yeah. and then, you know, your services are not open. So you again, mm -hmm. when I was saying that you might have some might be able to put them somewhere for one night and then in the morning mm -hmm. they can go to this service, but it's not open because you got to wait in the morning. Yes. So like, is it what I mean, my question was with services being open 24 seven Will that kid can that help you move people along a lot quicker instead of, you know, because idle time is a lot of time with frustrates people in. When you're dealing with those type of people, you don't want to really get them more agitated than they already are. Yes, absolutely. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, yes, 24-hour services um, or even a crisis center where we could take them and they could be there for in a safe space um, for 24 hours until we can reconnect with them. Part of the reason why we hired a, a nighttime peer support and a daytime peer support is to help with that warm introduction between the nighttime because it's gonna be difficult with so many services closed in the middle of the night um, for us to be able to really do much other than the emergency department, right? And so um, we wanted to be able to connect somebody in the daytime to another peer that, that could kind of take it from there, the baton from there and work with them. But there is no place, safe place to really take them for the most part in the middle of the night to kind of help them de-escalate and, and um, come down from whatever they, they're needing to come down from. So that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to um, thank everyone for having me. I have a class that I need to go facilitate. So um, thank you for having me and you all have a great evening. Thank you, Tremaine. Awesome information, education. Thank you. Hey, Robin, I have a thought real quick. Um, have you uh, maybe, you said everybody was a volunteer. Is that correct? No. no. I missed something. <laughs> They're all paid. They're all same okay. employees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I was almost envisioning maybe a team of retired doctors willing to do like an evening session as a um because they're doctors and they're retired and they don't have a full practice, but they're still licensed, a lot mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could do a call out and say, hey, any doctors who are bored in retirement want to work an evening shift? Yeah. Could you explain Portland Street Medicine and how you differ from them, please? Yeah. Um, Britt, do you want to talk at all or I can answer whichever? Um, so um, Portland Street Medicine is a uh, Another organization that has a very similar name to us, um, but they um, they actually do have doctors and um, doctors, nurses, I think social workers and maybe some other um, professions that respond to people on the streets and they can provide medical care there on the streets. But, and it is, I think, primarily a voluntary organization. Um, so it's, it's similar. Um, but yeah, they are mainly volunteer and they can do things uh, a little more advanced medical care than we would in like as a first responders, they can, you know, treat wounds and, and prescribe antibiotics and that kind of thing. Um, so we often lean on them if like, if we know someone needs additional treatment but doesn't wanna go to the hospital. So we may call them to come out um, and see people. And what are their hours? Um, I believe they're Monday through Friday, but I am not 100% sure. Okay, because my original question was night shift, graveyard, weekends, the things that Byron's talking about, he's dead on. We need the, you know, somebody to physically or mentally intervene in the middle of the night and there just doesn't seem to be a team of anyone out there really able to accommodate 
outside of the ERs. And so my brainstorm was, there's a lot of retired people in this community who are probably bored and may want to volunteer a time or two. You never know. So maybe we should put an ask out and see if there are folks out there like, you know, um, who, Bob Davis, retired doctor, right? Who might be interested in heading up some volunteer doctor programs like they have around the nation. So it's not unheard of, you know, I'm just putting it out there as an idea. Yeah, for sure. And I and I think that brings up a really good point, you know, and that question, what's the difference between Portland Street Medicine and Portland Street Response too, is that they are an outreach group and we are a first responder group. So all of our clients come through the 911 system and we're dispatched just like police or fire. We're not, we're not necessarily going out there and doing out, outreach and looking for clients. Although we do self-dispatch if we're out and we happen to see someone that needs our assistance, we'll pull over and create a call for ourselves. But Portland Street Medicine, they take referrals. We don't take referrals. We just respond to whatever is coming in to the 911 system. So that's a key differentiator too there for us. That's why I was thinking another idea might be needed. Okay, because they are different and they have different rules and yeah. outreach teams do different things. And so, one of the things that we are doing is um, trying to document where the gaps in the system are for us. So for instance, um, if we do need to take someone to a sobering center and it doesn't exist, we're documenting that in our charting so we can see how often this is a need um, for our team. And Something like that would be, you know, it'll be really interesting now that our graveyard shift is starting this week as we start to track the gaps in the system in the middle of the night versus in the daytime, right? We'll see those, those sort of disparities start to pop up for sure. Yeah, and Hooper Detox is still taking people, but not the alcohol sobering center part of it. So with the referral, people can still do a walk-in to Hooper Detox but it's, it's not a sobering center anymore. That's the part that closed. Just so folks know that it's still there and it still exists, but it's a different methodology to get in. You have to be referred now with like a bunch of assessments in order to get in there. So yeah, definitely. Well, that was an amazing, amazing night. I just love all this information Tia. and who? Tia. Sorry, Tia. <laughs> I, I don't see very well, so I might as well just, you know, like have help. That's why Barb's here to help me see. So Tia, you have another question? I don't know how much this will relate to our evening, but something that Robin said reminded me of domestic violence because I work with Bradley Engel. I, I volunteer at the Rehab Center, where Rehab Sisters, where many of our um, guests became unhoused because of a domestic violence situation. So it might be more for Chase, um, as I see he's from um, Portland Police Bureau. Um, what happens during a domestic violence phone call? And does PSR ever intervene in domestic violence? Chase, you wanna start with that one and then <laughs> I can answer this that second. Uh, so yeah, if it, I mean, if officers receive a domestic violence call, um, the, they'll obviously respond and make sure everything's safe. Um, and we had access to domestic violence advocates. Um, and I, I don't remember the exact hours, um, but I believe we just um, either have limited access now or have lost um, some of our access, I think, based on their staffing. Um, so that would be our go-to would be to try to connect them if we feel like there's um, they, there's someone who needs support or resources um, would, would be that. The TIP volunteers, is that who you're thinking of, Chase? No, something different. Not, okay. Not TIPs, yep, something different. Okay. Um, so we have, we have not gone on domestic violence. It doesn't quite fit inside of our criteria. However, it's a really interesting question because there are other mobile crisis teams in the United States right now that they do sort of do a co-response on domestic violence, but it sounds as though PPB already has a partner in place to be able to come and, and address them, that side of it that PSR might normally address. So, um, but that's a really interesting thought and question. Thank you for asking that to you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Is there, uh, Robin, one more thought. Is there like, 
a list that describes the calls you do go out on available, like, you know, um, a breakdown of how your program responds. Do you have anything on print? We do. Um, it was what was actually submitted to council and um, I'm happy to share that with you guys after the meeting and you can share it among your, um, your members here. But yes, there is a set of criteria. I would say though, again, it can intersect with other call types that aren't necessarily on that list. So like what we've seen is trespassing, suspicious person, um, unwanted person. You aren't gonna see those call types actually called out in the criteria itself. What you're gonna see is more of a list of scenarios um, rather than call types as examples of what we might respond to. But I am happy to share that with you for sure. That would be great because the more we can, you know, get down to, to telling people this is how it works, the less confusion will come when you need to buy for money. People will be on board with, oh, yeah, this is what they do. This is how they help us. And so some of that, you know, additional breakdown, like you were saying, could be an addendum, maybe written mm -hmm. saying these are the things we're actually responding to. You know, and we can add those as an addendum to what they put out originally. And then eventually over time, you'll have a big case scenario you can get more money from. So, yes. yes. Yeah. And what's really interesting uh, that came out of the six month evaluation report is based on just our current criteria. So if we don't change anything, if we weren't going to start going into residences or we weren't going to start taking suicide calls or more mental health calls, with the current caseload that we have, we would be looking at about 17,000 calls a year, 24-7. Um, and so that's a pretty sizable call load just in and of itself. What I predict will happen when we do begin to expand our, our call load and the types of calls that we can respond to, we'll probably be looking at more like 30,000 calls citywide to start with. And then as the community gets to know us and gets to trust us and um, knows that we're an option, we'll just see that number grow and grow. So I'm really, really excited and optimistic about um, what kind of impact Portland Street response can have to the overall first response system. That would be awesome. Barb has a more conversation to share with us. Well, I just wanted to thank you guys for coming for sure. Um, I always like it when you're around and thank you for the idea, Chase. Um, and I believe what this is named Dr. Greg Townley, Townley the one who did the um, analysis from PSU made a comment regarding people calling in to non-emergency or 911. Bowick's first thought should be, is this something PS PSR can take? And then go from there rather than going from the top with this, you know, they're not going to do guns. They're not going to do this. They're not going to do that. And I thought that was just really, really a great sort of ending wrap up thing. I don't know. Chase looks a little bit. Um, <laughs> maybe his face is just tired. Anyway, thanks, you guys. Um, Jared, did you want to say anything? No, I think I'm uh, good. I appreciate the conversation. Um, I think PSR is a, a great program and looking forward to its continued success and uh, appreciate the conversation tonight. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, we had another uh, topic on our agenda, the um, wellness directives, but um, they just, you know, I just basically saw them and I didn't feel it was like time to get cracking on those. So we can come back to talking about those after everybody gets a chance to read them and kind of put in their thoughts if they want to add or whatever to the directives. But I think, um, does anybody have any final like public comments or thoughts they want to share? We'll just let y'all get out of here a little early. Thank you guys for all your work and help. And if you need any support, please don't hesitate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. I'm going to end the meeting because we got six minutes left and it's late. Time to go. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Claudia.